Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. We'll be studying a single verse of Scripture. I'll add to that other related Scriptures. You won't have time to look them all up. I don't care how many years you were in Bible drill. You will have a chance, though, through your bulletin, to jot down what those references are and look them up again later in your own personal study. So be encouraged to do that, to write those down. But we're going to make sure that we think through what God would have us to say about a freed Jesus can set you free. Now I want to be clear at the outset about what I mean by a freed Jesus. Jesus was never chained by sin. Scripture is clear on that. That he was like us, yet without sin. No sins. But it was, there was a Saturday in which Jesus' body rested in a tomb, seemingly chained by death. However, not chained because Jesus was freed to be resurrected. And this Jesus, this Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, if he dwells in you, your life can be different. Your life can be changed. That's what we want to think about from Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Listen to what God said through uh, Paul to the church at Rome when he said this. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Again, if, if the spirit dwells in you, if the spirit dwells in you, in order to think about this verse, I just want to ask this question. Do you feel chained? Do you feel weighed down? You might be chained by a body that has cravings towards things that are wrong. You might be, it might be that substances help your body to call out for something and you know you shouldn't, but you're tempted and you want to in your own body. It might be that you're craved, uh, you're craving in your own mind, not just a body, but maybe a mind, a mind that's chained by wrong ways of thinking, things that go against God, things that don't want to believe, things that, uh, uh, where you believe things that are not true about yourself, but you believe them to be true, and, and maybe you're chained by something in your mind. Are you just chained by a mind that can't make up its mind? I mean, I don't know what you might be experiencing today, but I don't think I'm alone when I say that there are times where I feel chained. That is, my body, my flesh, wants to do something that I know is wrong. My mind thinks things that aren't true. My heart should feel one way and feels another. And here we are, just living our lives in the middle of this moment, and we just can't seem to do what we know we should do, we're not alone. Paul himself, super Christian if you want to say so, church planter in all throughout Greece, Asia Minor, even all the way to Rome, the central power of that day, Paul said in Romans chapter 7 verse 15, I don't understand my own actions. I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I don't want is what I keep on doing. And I don't think I'm alone in saying that a moment like that hits all of us. Maybe hits us, maybe, maybe it even defines our every day. Whoever we are, whatever we're dealing with, there are times where our body, our mind, our heart is chained. We know what's right. We can't seem to pull it off. 
We know what's right. We don't want to do what's right. We just want to follow what we want to do. And the world encourages this. Just do what you feel. Just do you. You just do you. Just, just how, whatever you think is therefore probably right. And, and so we'll just let you be over here and do whatever it is that you feel like is right. And that's okay and we're not going to judge. This is the kind of thing that the world encourages and does. But friend, there is a right and a wrong. And it doesn't come from my opinion. It doesn't even come from what our parents taught us. There is a right and a wrong, and it's given to us by God in his word. The problem is that when we, are, we know these things now, the struggle begins of knowing that we're in the wrong and trying to do something about this. Listen, friend, Easter is for you. It's for me. Look again at the verse, Romans 8, 11. If, if. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead. Now let's just pause right there. Because we'll talk about what this spirit can do in us. But first, can we just talk about the spirit who raised him from the dead? Think about this for a second. Think about this. What did the spirit of God do? I'm glad you asked. The spirit of God did this in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The spirit of God rolled the stone away from the tomb of Jesus. Through the angels who were there. In strength and in power. The Spirit of God sent an earthquake on that first Easter daylight morning. The Spirit of God sent two shining angels. Y'all, blinding light. The likes of which you struggle to look at with the naked eye. Blinded by the same way that lightning blinds night sky. In the same way these angels were there. And this is sent from heaven itself by the Spirit of God to come down and do these things. It's the Spirit of God that fulfilled ancient prophecy, hundreds of years old, that it was always the plan that the Son of God would come, the Son of God would never sin, and the Son of God would die for the sins of mankind. That was always the plan. And it's the Spirit of God who accomplished this. It's the Spirit of God who did what Jesus had done in John chapter 11 with Lazarus. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus opened his eyes and took his breath and felt his heart beating. The Son of God is the only one powerful enough to raise people from the dead. And when he lay dead in the tomb on Saturday, when Sunday morning's sunrise came, the Spirit of God said this, I'm sure, it's not in Scripture, I'm only imagining the Spirit of God say to his Son, Son, come out. And the Spirit of God brought breath back to the Jesus' lungs. The Spirit of God opened Jesus' eyes. The Spirit of God caused Jesus' heart to beat again. And Jesus stood up. And it was the Spirit of God who unwrapped those linen cloths from him, unwrapped the facial cloth from his face, laid all that there in that tomb because he didn't need grave clothes any longer because Jesus was now back because of the Spirit of God. And when we encounter our problems and we feel chained and we're unsure of what to do, I just want to remind us, what you need, what I need, is somebody more powerful than us. And I can't think of anyone more powerful than the Spirit of God. And what he did on that day was prove to the world that his son was not just a man, not just a guy, not just somebody worth retweeting, not just somebody that was interesting, not just somebody that made some people happy and some people mad. No, no. He was the Son of God because the Spirit of God raised him back from the dead. Y'all, there are plenty of other religions and they all worship as, uh, people they hold sacred who are still in their tombs today. But we serve a risen Savior who came out of an empty tomb 
And he was brought to life because of the power of the Spirit of God. And we live our lives in fear and anxiety. We live our lives struggling with our own flesh. We live our lives in a small way, thinking that we're kind of the center of the universe, maybe because of our social media, maybe because we just think about ourselves all the time and we struggle to think about anybody else. We live our lives in this way, and we have these blinders on our eyes, just like those horses do when they're in the middle of the city, trying not to be distracted by those other things. Listen, friend, I want to open open our eyes by the scriptures to say that we need to remember that if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead and just pause right there if he does anything <laughs> if he does anything it's going to be worth it it's going to be amazing it's going to be powerful it's going to knock your socks off if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead Wow, well what about if? What, what could he do? What might happen? There's a second thing I want us to think about. A second thing, and that's from the last half of this verse. If that spirit dwells in you, dwells in you. What does it mean that the spirit dwells in you? This is the Holy Spirit living in your life. Now there are other Christian brothers and sisters who would say that you have to have an evidence of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit inside you. And they would say, in their denomination, they would say that an evidence of the Spirit is that you could speak in a language that's not understood, and then somebody would translate that. And I would say that happened in Scripture, absolutely. But you know what I'm looking for in my life? I'm looking for the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because listen, friends, if I have self-control over my life, it's not because I'm strong. It's not because I built good habits. It's not because my mom taught me right. It's because the Spirit dwells in me. And then, through, through the fruit He produces out of my life, self-control is there. You can't love your enemy by yourself. Who do you think it is that can help you to love, truly love, in a world that's anger, in a world that, that's all caps social media, in a world that's left versus right, up versus down, rich versus poor, black versus white, in a world that is nothing but anger? It would be the Spirit of God who could cause us to be people of love, love, even loving our enemies because of the Jesus we served who looked at the soldiers who crucified him and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing because of the love. And it was the Jesus who got down on his knees and washed the feet of the Judas who betrayed him. Judas was at the Last Supper partaking of the bread and the cup. There was a moment where Jesus said to Judas, go on, go do what you're going to do. But up until that moment, there was Judas in the room with Jesus. And the Jesus who loves the Spirit of God who raised him from the dead can give you a fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Love, joy, peace. Think of all these things. You want those things in your life. But remember, we're chained, and we just can't seem to do it. I'm reminded of Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. If you want to jot this for later, look. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Do you not know... That all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, again, baptized into Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death, Jesus' death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. If you want a new life, there's someone who can give it to you. But you won't get it by trying harder. You won't get it by a specialized program. You won't get it just by um, your own strength or maybe even some loving support of those around you. Those are not enough. Those are not enough. Instead, we are to remember that we are baptized into Christ Jesus. That is, Jesus died. And then Jesus came back up from the dead in the same way. We're dead in sins, but through the Spirit... Through the Spirit, changing us on the inside, then we are made alive in Christ. We have a new life at that point. So I'm just here to very simply say, 
in a short and to the point Easter sermon. Listen, friend. If the Spirit dwells in you, He will also give you life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. So if you want the chains to break, if you want the mind to think correctly, if you want your body to be craving what is good, if you want your heart to feel the way it's supposed to, it is the Spirit of God who can transform you to do that. Now, He transforms you in two ways. The first is simply this. As we're being transformed by the Spirit, I want you to think about step number one, the first step. First step, recognize your sin. Recognize your sin. If you want to jot down Romans 3.23, but it might be a verse you already know. Romans 3.23 explains that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I'm here to give you the bad news first. That you're a sinner, as am I. It's not okay, it's not good. It's also not, you know, everybody is a sinner, so it's not that big a deal. Actually, it is a big deal. Because our sin not only makes God angry at what we've done, it also separates us from God. Sin is separation. Sin brings death. Write down that Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8. God shows his love for us and that while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. Now it might be, yes, true, that according to the scriptures that God is angry at what you've done, God loves you, though. Again, he's angry at what you've done. He's angry at the sin in your life. And if you are a sinner, not saved by grace, then judgment is coming. The judge will stand before you. You will look him in the eyes and you all have a conversation about everything that you've ever done or said. Even the things you've only thought. That conversation is coming. But it doesn't have to be a conversation that makes us afraid because while we're still sinners, Christ died for us. And Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit, can literally change who you are. Now remember the crucifixion and resurrection story. Remember what we've been thinking about all week long. Who recognized that they were a sinner? I think about Peter. I think about the Apostle Peter. Because here he is, loving Jesus with all of his um, fierce nature, with all of his rambunctious attitudes, with all of his loud mouth. Peter, saying he'll follow Jesus anywhere, and Jesus says, well, actually, tonight, before the rooster crows at daybreak, you're going to just pretend you don't even know me at least three times. And it went just like that, just as Jesus said. So here Peter is saying, no, 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 not me, not me. And here he is in a moment, afraid. They've arrested Jesus. They're in there giving him a, a fake trial. And they're there just to try to get what they need to just be able to say that they're going to kill him. And out in the courtyard outside, Peter, one of the only ones bold enough to follow them that far, even though he was afraid of being arrested, he was there. No, I don't know him. No, I don't know him. I don't even know that man. And then Jesus looks at him and the rooster crows. Peter's heart breaks. And scripture says he runs away and just cries and cries and cries bitterly. Because Peter recognized he was a sinner. Friends, some of us are too stubborn to admit what's true. Don't be. Don't be that way. Admit honestly to yourself that as cleaned up as you might be in your life, that your heart might be far from God. Maybe. Maybe. I'm not here to say what your heart is or isn't. I am here to say that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, will help you to understand where you are and what kind of heart you truly have. But if you're a sinner, and we all are, the first step is to recognize and admit that we are a sinner. Because the next step then here is this. The next step is that we would turn to Jesus for forgiveness. Listen, you don't have to stay a sinner. Nobody has to remain a sinner. Everybody can be changed. This whole world can be absolutely different. An upside down world that's nothing like what it is today. If people would just turn to Jesus for forgiveness. Jot down and look this up later. Romans chapter 6 verse 23. Romans 6 23. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life 
in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everybody knows what a paycheck is. You're looking forward to it every week or every month. But sin gets you a paycheck you don't like. Because death is separation. Physical death is your soul leaves your body and they put your body in the coffin and in the dirt. And your soul goes and has a conversation with Jesus. Spiritual separation is where you and God are supposed to be in a relationship, but sin brings a paycheck, and the paycheck is death, and your soul is separated from the life-giving God who breathed life into your soul. So you don't want this paycheck, friend, no matter what day of the month it is, because the wages of sin will bring us death. But the Christmas present, Pun intended, because on that first Christmas morning, Jesus what came as a baby to save the day, and here he is, the free gift, the free gift of God to you, eternal life, eternal life. Not, but the problem is the sin, and so the sin and the death's got to go away, and the eternal life can then come. How does it come? It comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And our Lord just means he's the boss. He's the master. He's the one in charge. He is the one ruling your life. Step number next here is to turn to Jesus for forgiveness. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Jot that down. James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted with evil. And he himself, God, tempts no one. But each person is tempted when... He is lured and enticed by his own desire. Remember that we're chained. Our own desires luring us towards sin. And then when desire has conceived, lo and behold, the baby that ha happens is actually sin. And when that sin grows up, it becomes death. This is what happens. Temptation is luring and, des and our desires are enticing. And they're pulling us towards sin and away from God. We need to turn instead away from our sin, away from ourselves, away from our desires, away from the way things used to be. Repent means to turn, and we turn towards Jesus, and we say, Jesus, please, I want my life to be about you. Please, I'm sorry, forgive me. James chapter 1, verse 21, write that down. James 1, 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls with meekness. You can't be arrogant. You have to be humble enough to say, I'm sorry to the God you offended, to the God I offended. Friends, this is one of the reasons that children have an easier time to say yes to Jesus. Because there's no arrogance in a child. There's just innocence often in a child. Now, they might have rebellion, but there's not any arrogance there. The child just is humble enough because they already have to be humble in their household. They're not in charge. They have no power. There they are. And in their relationship with God, they just are better able to humble themselves and get rid of the junk and say yes to God. But friends, I've seen adults do it. Haven't you? I've seen senior adults do it. I've seen teenagers do it. I've seen people of all ages do it, where they say, I'm tired of who I used to be, and what I want is the Jesus who can save me. And they are humble enough to bow before the king and just say, I, 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 help. That's what I'm asking you to do today, if you have not already done so. Turn to Jesus for forgiveness. Write this down, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Romans chapter 8. Verses 1 and 2, because listen, friends, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. I'm not making these things up. I just want to point to you and show you this. And listen, if you ever turn to Jesus, you'll find forgiveness there. You'll discover that your sins are gone. You'll feel a weight lifted off your shoulders. It'll be the most amazing thing that happens to you. It will be a glorious thing. But listen to me. It also means this. There is no condemnation after that. So when Satan comes to you and says, you remember how you used to be? You can say, I agree. I used to be that way. But now no longer. Because, not because I'm good. Not because I put a tie on. 
because Jesus set me free from who I used to be. That's me. This is me. And I need to remember what God told me that there's no condemnation anymore. I need to remember what God said that he set me free from flesh, from sin, from death. And there's another law that I live. That's just the law of the spirit of life. The spirit of life in me helping me to be the person that I'm supposed to be. The person I was always supposed to be in Jesus. As we think about this turn to Jesus for forgiveness. I think about somebody in the crucifixion story. There were two thieves who were also killed on crosses right beside Jesus. And those two thieves had two different perspectives on the Jesus being killed. The Jesus being killed there, one of them poked fun, hurled insults, had negative things to say. You've seen people do this. This is a classic schoolyard bully. They just got lots to say. And it doesn't matter that he's dying, literally dying, being crucified on a cross because of sins he actually committed. He got caught, he got busted, and he got punished. But even in his last moments, he's hurling out insults. The evil that's coming from his heart is just bubbling out of his mouth. And here he is making fun of the Jesus who didn't deserve to be there, but was glad to be there for you and for me and for that thief. Glad to be on the cross for that thief. But the second thief, the other thief, tried to get him to to just hush his mouth and looked at Jesus Knowing that he had said there, he's not worthy of this. And knowing he was the son of God, he looked at Jesus and he said, Will you just remember me? Because I know where you're going and I ain't. So can you like not forget about me when you get there? And Jesus said, you're coming with me. You're coming with me. You're coming with me. What love. What mercy. And what power that even at his deathbed God would grant a merciful life change in the heart of the thief on that cross all he had to do was turn to Jesus for forgiveness friends there's another step and I'm just going to be honest with you this next step is one that a lot of Christians don't do this next step is this give your entire life to the Lord You ever notice it's kind of easy to give Jesus uh, Easter, Christmas? Maybe a little bit of, you know, cross on the wall in the house. Maybe a bumper sticker or a t-shirt or, and maybe, I mean, maybe even give him like once a month or give him a little bit or maybe, you know, throw a little 20 in the plate or a prayer up to heaven every now and again, especially when you need something, especially when you need something. And here you are thinking that maybe Jesus is just this vending machine. And if I can put in a good deed, a few bucks in the offering plate, a prayer, or a couple Bible verses. If I can just put the right combination of something in, then out of the Jesus vending machine might pop something that will help my life a little bit. And so you'll take your life over here, and then you'll take a little Jesus and add it to your life. It won't work. That's not the Holy Spirit living in you. That's you adding a little Jesus to your routine. I'm asking you to really think about that you should maybe give your entire life to the Lord. Through what you do, not what you say. Through what you do, not what you say. Listen to what Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Again, jot this down. Look this up later. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul says, listen, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. He says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. Listen, give your body as a living sacrifice. I think you understand what this means. Because if you have bacon and eggs for breakfast, the chicken gave a little bit. But the pig... The pig gave it all. Okay? The pig gave it all. Chicken gave a little bit, but the pig gave it all. That's what, this this is exactly what God wants. Listen, 
I mean, this makes sense to you if you just sit down and think about it. Listen, God gave you your life, and then you spend it on yourself? God gave you the same amount of time that the richest man on earth has, and how do you spend it? God gave you something where he wants to bless your life and give you happiness. Listen, the Garden of Eden was the way it was supposed to go. It'll be a beautiful day when Jesus returns in this world and there's a new heaven and a new earth and we spend time with him, see him face to face, live in a relationship of the kingdom of God right there with him and all the evil will finally be gone. That's when no more crying will happen, no more pain will occur. That'll be a beautiful day. But listen, we're not there yet. And in the meantime, God doesn't ask for a tip. He wants your whole life. And I want to remind you that Jesus didn't give you a little bit. Jesus gave you all he could give you. There's not any more he could give. What is there left to give if he's literally given his life because he loved you? And Paul says we should present our bodies as a living sacrifice. You know that in Old Testament days the lamb would die, bleed until it was over. That's the sacrifice. And Jesus, praise be to God, was the lamb that was slain for our sins. So it's God, God's good plan that his own son would die for the sins of mankind. Our job is not to be killed physically. Our job is to give our whole life to him as a sacrifice that never has to die, but instead keeps living for Jesus. That's our job. Be a living sacrifice, giving ourselves to him completely, though, our whole life. And when we do that, God makes sure that we're a holy sacrifice. That's a set apart, a special sacrifice our lives are. Because our lives are made righteous in Christ. So you got a good life then at that point. And when you give that sacrifice to God, he's excited about what you gave him. Because your life is full of righteousness and the fruit of the spirit and beautiful things. And this is our spiritual worship. But don't be conformed to the world. You need a new brain. You need a brain transplant. You need a new way of thinking. And that's, remember, remember, we're chained. And we need the Spirit of God to give us a new way to think. And it happens when we give Him our life. When we give Him our life. Our entire life. Write this down that James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. James chapter 1, verses 22 to 25. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Lie unto yourselves. The one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and then keeps going, perseveres, that one, not a hearer who forgets something, but a doer who does something, he'll be blessed in his doing. Every wife knows that if that husband had really been listening, he'd have got up off the couch. It's the same thing with God. You can give him lip service all you want to. He knows where your heart really is. And he knows that because of how you really think and because of what you do. What you do. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. Just jot that down. This is a familiar passage from Jesus himself. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And a second's like it. You're going to love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments, all the law, all the prophets in the Old Testament, everything hinges on those two things. Love God with everything you've got. Not part of your heart. Not a little bit of your time. Not just some of you. Love God with everything you've got. John 14, verses 23 through 26. Write that down. John 14, verses 23 through 26. Jesus says to his disciples, listen, if anybody loves me, he'll keep my word. Yeah, you can talk about loving me, but are you doing it? If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me, Jesus says, does not keep my words. He goes on to explain more about that and talk about how the helper, the Holy Spirit, would come later. And that brings us to the next step. This last step I want us to think about. Well, let me just say this, though. As we're thinking about this step of giving your entire life to the Lord, and as I'm thinking about the crucifixion story and the resurrection story, I'm thinking about Thomas. I'm thinking about the guy who said, did he really come back from the dead? I really kind of need to see his hands and feet first, because I'm really not sure that he did. This is Thomas 
unsure. This is Thomas with doubts. This is Thomas who'd been following Jesus, hesitating. Even though Jesus had said he would come back from the dead, but Jesus, because of love, Jesus appears and says, Thomas, look, look. And then he says a negative thing and a positive thing. Stop disbelieving. Start believing. That's the day Thomas looks at him and says, my Lord and my God, my master and the one in charge, the son of God, God himself. Thomas has a moment of transformation and he stops with the doubting and he stops with the half of his life and he starts with his entire life to God. This last step, think about this with me. This very next step, final step I want us to think about is this. Walk with the Holy Spirit every day. Walk with the Holy Spirit every day. Again, I'm not looking for ecstatic utterances from you. I'm looking for the fact that God is in your life, changing your life from the inside out. Remember again that if you feel chained, it's the Spirit of God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead who can dwell in you and give you a new life. Jot down John chapter 4, or sorry, John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17, when Jesus said, If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper. The Spirit of truth. The Spirit of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. For this reason I remind you, fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Now this here is this idea, the spirit, kind of meaning what's inside you. Like your soul, like your way of thinking. So it's not quite Holy Spirit in this phrase. But I do want you to understand, Paul said, listen, young Timothy, you're scared, you're a pastor, you're a little unsure of yourself. But I want you to understand, you just need to put more wood on the fire. Because it needs to get hot for Jesus. And you need to remember that you don't have an attitude that runs around scared all the time. Because you don't have a God who's scared. You have a God who's powerful. You have a God who shows love. And you have a God who's able to control himself, Jesus himself, controlling himself. And that's the kind of attitude or spirit that God can put in you and put in me. John chapter 16. Jot this last passage down. John chapter 16. Beginning of verse 7 through 11. John 16, 7 through 11. Again, Jesus' own words. But if I go to heaven, disciples, listen, I'm going to send him, the helper, the Holy Spirit, to you. And when he comes, he'll convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, judgment. He'll convict the world concerning sin because they don't believe in me and I'm the way to God. Verse 10, he's going to convict the world concerning righteousness. See, because I'm going to the Father and I won't be here anymore. And he's going to convict concerning judgment because... The ruler of this world, that is Satan, is judged. The ruler of this world, Satan, the dog God has on a leash and is allowing to run around the yard of the world right now, this one is judged. He's judged because Jesus let evil kill him. And when Satan thought he'd won, the world turned upside down. The stones shattered. The veil in the temple that separated people from the Holy Spirit of God, the Holy of Holies, that veil split right down the middle from top to bottom. Death was so beaten that there were even a few other people who came back to life like Lazarus and walked around. Scriptures explain, listen, the Spirit of God did all of these things and Satan was shown to be wrong, powerless, evil, and done still allowed to run around a little while longer and that's why we still feel chained as as he tempts us as he struggles with us look again at Romans 8 11 to finish Romans 8 11 remember again this is what we're thinking if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you 
he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also, will also, will guaranteed also give you life in your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Listen, friends, this is not an idea. This is something that places like the Mercy House in Georgetown, Mississippi, practice every day where somebody trapped in addiction is set free by the Holy Spirit. Not once, but because they walk with the Holy Spirit every day. And I'm just asking us to think about that this morning. Would you stand, please?